I'm Scott, and this video is a time lapse of my entire motion control slider project from start to finish. In 15 minutes, it covers about 24 hours of work over the course of 6 days, mistakes and all. During the video, I'll talk about some of the issues I ran into, the components I used, and some things I like to change to improve the device. If you have any questions or suggestions, please let me know in the comments. And for an overview of how the slider works, check out my other video at this link or visit s.co.tt slash mcslider. On the bench I have a Sane Smart 20x4 character LCD, a slider pot also sold by Sane Smart, a stepper motor from a make block kit, some buttons, and a stepper motor driver. The laptop is there at this point more for research than actual programming. I spent a decent amount of time just figuring out how to get the stupid display to work. The Sane Smart LCD is an inexpensive and pretty common design which uses something like 16 I.O. pins. This one though has an I2C interface piggybacked onto it. I went with that because it only uses two I.O. pins besides 5 volts and ground. It means it actually leaves something over for the rest of the components. Even though I got it working just fine, I didn't end up using the display too much in the end. I'll get into that more later. What also didn't work out too well was the stepper motor driver that I'd ordered. I got a standard driver, which moves the motor in full steps, whereas what I really needed for smooth motion was a micro step driver, which can move the motor in fractional steps. Fortunately, I had a pretty good micro step driver from my make block kit, and so that's what you'll see in the final assembly. Micro step drivers are generally more expensive, but they're a necessity. The first step of the assembly was to get all the mechanical and electronic stuff mounted to the camera slider. I didn't choose the slider specifically for this project. It's a cheap and not very good one that I picked up from Amazon to play around with. The good thing about it is that it has two tripod mounting holes at either end in addition to the threads for the legs. That's why I didn't really need to do anything ingenious here. I just put some bolts through those tripod mounts and the make block beams and torqued down a couple of nuts really tight. It works and I don't have to modify the slider at all. That being said, I could have drilled some new holes in the track that would fit the bolts just right to make for a more solid structure. I had a hell of a time finding a timing belt that was the right length for the track, at least at a decent price. I ended up getting a belt that was just a bit too short, which I joined to another length of belt that I had lying around. I wasn't really sure how to connect the two belts together, so I stapled them using regular paper staples. It works for now, but it's definitely a point of failure. That being said, when I googled how to splice a timing belt, the number one answer was don't splice a timing belt. So if anyone out there finds a closed timing belt of the right size for a 42 inch slider track, let me know. But for now I'll stick to my staples. To attach the belt to the carriage, I put a couple of washers underneath the tension knob and snugged it down over the two ends. Again, probably not the best, but it works. At either end of the track I mounted roller micro switches. The carriage hits them when it travels to the edges, which both helps to prevent damage to the motor and the driver, but is also used to calibrate the software. In regular operation the carriage never actually touches the micro switches. It gently decelerates and stops just shy of them. Programmatically, the calibration I'm talking about isn't very complicated. The motor is run in one direction until the switch that's at the end of that direction of travel is closed. The motor then runs in the opposite direction towards the other switch, and the number of steps along the way is counted. It does that again back to the starting point, and compares the number of steps it counted in each direction. If they differ more than 5%, the controller gives an error and offers to recalibrate. After I got the basic mechanical parts of the slider put together, I tested them using a really simple program. All it did was like bounce the carriage between the micro switches at either end of the track. It hits one, reverses direction, and then hits the other. It does the same thing over and over. It was a good proof of concept and a sort of milestone in the project. I threw one of my DSLRs on there to grab some test footage, and it came out rather well. At that point, I hadn't been using the right stepper library, so the camera was moving very slowly. But that worked out great for the time lapse video. I then moved on to laying out the control panel. The design was something that I put together in Photoshop, which I then measured and transferred onto the cover of the project box. I had to tweak it a little bit to match the actual sizes of the components, but overall it pretty much went as planned. One mistake was that I marked the surface of the box with a sharpie. I figured that I'd be able to clean it off with alcohol. Apparently you shouldn't use permanent marker on ABS plastic. It gets absorbed into the material and doesn't come off completely. I guess in retrospect maybe that should have been obvious, and it wouldn't have been such a big deal were it not for the fact that I got clear labels onto which I printed the cover decal. I chose to mount all of the controls and components to the cover of the box so that I could open it up without having the leads running into the box itself. It makes for easier construction and troubleshooting, but also meant that I had to use a very large housing. If you're going to embark on this sort of project, it's probably worth going a smaller route. The big controller can be a bit cumbersome. By the way, I started off trying to drill the ABS with regular old wood drill bits. For small screw holes, they work great, 
but for the larger button and switch holes, the big bits just tore into the material. I found some advice online that said that step bits are the best for ABS and ordered a pretty inexpensive yet good quality set. They were just the right tool for the job and made perfect burr free holes. While I was waiting for the step bits to arrive, Amazon Prime is a fantastic thing by the way, I decided to test out the buttons that I got. They're single pole, momentary contact, normally open, and they have internal LEDs. I only saw them in product photos and I wanted to see how they'd look in real life. I have a decent amount of Cat5 cable lying around, so I use that as hookup wire for a lot of the connections. I found it worked out pretty well and kept things neat wherever I need to run wires in pairs, like for the buttons. Incidentally, the buttons are something I screwed up. I could have sworn that they came with 5 volt LEDs, so I hooked them up directly to the Arduino. It turns out there are 3 volt LEDs and I ended up having to replace a couple that I blew out. Fortunately, the step bits arrived so I could get back to the control panel while I was waiting for the new buttons. For straight cuts, all I had on hand was a coping saw. Actually, I tried using an X-Acto knife first. It barely made a dent in the thick ABS. I even tried heating it with a soldering iron, hoping that it would melt like a hot knife through butter. It didn't, and it just made a mess and ruined one of my blades. Maybe it's due to my crappy hand-eye coordination, but although the coping saw cut the plastic pretty well, because I did use a really fine tooth blade, it was by no means perfect. I ended up having to tweak a lot of my cuts with a file. That made a huge mess, so I wouldn't recommend it. I hear that a nibbler is the best tool for the job, and I probably should have ordered one along with the drill bits. The one benefit of using the file and getting the holes just right was I was able to mount the LCD with a really tight friction fit. It was going to be a pain in the ass to get at just the right depth by screwing it from behind using offsets, and it probably wouldn't hold up to heavy abuse, but I've been playing around with the controller a lot and so far the display hasn't budged. I mean, a little bit of glue would make the connection permanent, but I want the flexibility to mess around with the design in the future. Besides the control panel, there's a small project box that I bought to hold the stepper motor driver and all the hookups for the slider track components. Of course, I sized the box for the wrong stepper driver, so I ended up having to bolt the microstep driver to the outside of it. That worked out fine because the microstep driver has its own housing, though it would have been a lot neater if I just found a bigger box. Then again, it does allow for easy access to the dip switches on the driver, which can be useful to scale the speed of the carriage. For the cover label, or decal, whatever you want to call it, I used full sheet 8.5 by 11 Avery shipping labels. They were cheap and worked pretty well. I thought it'd be cool to use clear labels so that I could have the gray plastic show through in certain parts of the design. That was a bad move because besides allowing my ill-removed layout markings to become visible, it made the coloring on the rest of the label really dull. In the video you'll see that the blue pops a lot more on the white paper backing, and it's something I probably should have considered, but I didn't. I did the graphics in Photoshop, which should have worked out okay, but even though I measured and laid everything out to like half a millimeter precision, there was some kind of scaling happening between the measurements in Photoshop and the final printed design. I printed it with no scaling, of course, so I'm assuming it's some vagary of the printer or the drivers. The point is that I had to do a lot of back and forth with the test prints to get everything just the way I wanted it. I printed the label with a few different color schemes and finished off my favorite two with a couple of coats to the tester's lacquer. The labels are inkjet printed, so the lacquer should help prevent the ink from rubbing off and making it somewhat water resistant. I actually tested the sheet that I didn't use for the project, and though a few drops of water didn't cause the ink to run, which it did on the uncoated copy, when I tried to dry the water off, it smudged the hell out of the area. Now, I don't know how people usually mount an Arduino to a project box, but here's what I did. I used four brass offsets, the kind you usually find attaching a motherboard to a computer case, and attached them to the Arduino through its mounting holes using screws. Using a white paint marker, I marked the tips of the four offsets and set the Arduino into position. The paint transferred to the inside surface of the case, providing reference marks in the precise location of the mounts. I drilled on those markings about halfway through the plastic, being very careful not to punch all the way through to the other side. I sanded the ABS around each hole to roughen the surface for better adhesion, and mixed up a little bit of JB weld. After removing the offsets from the Arduino, I dipped the threads of each one into the JB weld before screwing them into the shallow holes I drilled. Now only a couple of the threads caught, but it was enough to hold them in place. I then screwed the Arduino down, being very careful not to pull out any of the offsets. By doing that, I kept the offsets square to the case and perfectly aligned while the JB weld set. That actually worked out really well. It's a pretty solid mount. The best part is that it's completely invisible from the outside, and the Arduino is removable. Mounting the rest of the components was pretty straightforward. The power and speed lockout switches snapped right in, while the buttons and power jacks have a nut that's screwed on from the back. Fortunately, I put those on before I soldered the leads, because I made that mistake before. The potentiometer didn't come with mounting screws, but I had a couple of the right size that I think I'd stripped off a laptop. I did countersink the screw heads for a little bit of a cleaner look. 
I wanted external access to the Arduino's USB connector, but I hadn't wanted to awkwardly hack away at the rim of the cover and the top edge of the project box, so I got a short USB whip which is meant for panel mounting. To connect everything to the Arduino, I used a solderable breadboard shield. Besides providing through holes for the wiring and resistors, it also means that I can easily and neatly disconnect everything from the Arduino in case I need to replace it in the future. I never did end up buying a set of helping hands to hold stuff in place while I soldered. So I ended up taping the circuit board down to the table and propping it up in all sorts of weird ways while I connected everything. Wiring up the interface box was really straightforward. There's no board in there, just splices between the wires on the DB25 connector and the micro switches. The box doesn't do much except contain the ends of all those cables. One thing I might update with that interface box though is to use modular connectors like RJ45s or something to hook up the micro switches and the motor. I used big fat DB25 connectors between the slider and the controller because I wanted all those pins for future expansion. I also ganged up a bunch of the wires for both supply and ground because the relatively high amperage stepper motor gets its power via that cable. Another change I'll probably make is to move the power connection from the controller to the interface box. The slider is usually immobile, so it ends up being more convenient to put the extra connection there. I'll probably also add a power switch and an LED to the interface box in that case. There's also a voltage regulator in the controller which brings a 12 volt input down to 5 volts for the Arduino. I use a 12 volt supply because the stepper motor driver is powered at that voltage. Moving the DC input to the interface box would also allow me to move the voltage regulator there, but I'm probably better off sending the 12 volts over the interface cable to mitigate voltage drop, especially if I need to use a longer cable. I think that overall this project came together pretty well. Except for the programming. And I know it's lame to write shitty code and then just apologize for it rather than fix it, but that's exactly what I'm going to do. The code is available for download on my site, but try not to hate me too much when you read through it. There's some ignorance and some laziness in there to be sure. This was a long project and by the time I got to the software I was in that get it done mode of thinking. Now, mea culpas aside, there are some reasonable compromises that I had to make to solve some of the problems that you might have to face. In fact, the biggest defect in this project was that I started off with an Arduino. A Raspberry Pi or something more powerful would have been a better choice. The main challenge is that to get a smooth motion out of the slider with a decent top speed and enough torque to move it, I need to move the stepper motor very frequently. So frequently that I had to sacrifice high speed for smooth motion. I also had to sacrifice updating the LCD during motion and only pull one control button or potentiometer per loop. I'm using the Excel stepper library, which very nicely generates smooth acceleration and deceleration. However, the calculations for both eat further into the Arduino's meager processing power. The LCD library also eats up a lot of CPU cycles. Updating the LCD during movement causes the slider to stop for a few milliseconds. It's noticeable while watching the camera move, but it's absurdly obvious on the video that the camera's recording. Originally, I was going to use the display to show things like carriage speed and position, but in the end I took out a whole lot of display updates. It's used during the startup phase for calibration, and that's pretty much it. However, it's going to come into play in the future. You can see on the control panel that the buttons have alternate labels like menu, up, down, and enter. Eventually, I want to implement a menu system that lets you record and save various movements, as well as things like a speed multiplier for more fine or coarse grain potentiometer adjustments, display units, meters versus feet, and acceleration rates. The code I published for this is completely open. I mean, use it with or without attribution, and without is probably better to save me some embarrassment, but I do ask that if you go and improve it, please send me a copy. I'd love to see how it should have turned out. I'm hoping that it's at least a halfway decent starting point if you're doing the same sort of project. Speaking of which, I did this entire project blind, which is to say that I'm sure there are a lot of other better DIY motion control sliders, but I didn't look at any of them first. I find it more enjoyable to plan everything out from scratch, but that means that I make a lot of mistakes along the way. I guess what I'm trying to say is that I hope that this was helpful to you if you're looking to embark upon a similar project, but I can't say this video has shown you the best way to go about it. Anyway, thanks for listening and head on over to my site, s.co.tt, for downloads and a full materials list.